going to stay in this, this kind of atmosphere as I read God's Word. Acts chapter 27, that's where I'm going today. Acts chapter 27, you can pull your Bibles out, you can follow along with us on the Sky Bible. Acts chapter 27, and I'm going to read a little bit into 28. This is going to be good. Y'all thought last week was going to be good. It was good. Ugh. Wait till you hear this one. It's not me. God's got something, a word for us today. That's all I got to say. Last week we started off this series, and hopefully you were fired up to run to the roar. Look at your neighbor and say, are you running yet? Are you running yet? Man, hopefully you were fired up to run the roar. Did we have some people that had the tenacity of David this week? Come on, you said, I ran quickly to the battle line. Man, I, I hope so, because this series, you know, this series is, the motto of this series is we're running fearless into 2019. That fear may have had you cowering down, and it may have had you run in the opposite direction, and depression, and anxiety, and, and doing all these other things that fear can do to you, but we're learning how to run to the roar. We're learning how to chase that lion. And last week, I may have fired you up. Something happened inside of me I didn't see coming in a while. But I need to be honest with you. Running to the roar isn't easy, guys. It's not easy. You can get, maybe some of you started running to the roar this week, and something happened. You're like, well, Pastor, I tried. <laughs> but you see, I, I, I thought about that. So today, I wanted to take this time to really show you see, because you know how it's that, that you make that New Year resolution, and you're like, I'm going to get buff, like I'm on steroids, I'm not taking steroids, I'm going to look like it, you know, and you're like motivated, and like you first 10 days, you're in the gym, and you're like, oh yeah, but then you're just like, you miss that McDouble from McDonald's, and it starts calling your name, the Big Mac, it's like, come back to me, please. And so, uh, and so you're like 10 days in and you just stop. And it can kind of be the same way as you learn how to run to the roar. The moment something bad happens and you get bit by that lion, you can be like, oh, I didn't think it was that way. And you go back the opposite direction, back into the same habits that you did years before. But I got a message for you today that's very practical that will help you to continue running to the roar even when things go bad. Acts chapter 27, that's where we're at. We're going to be looking at Paul. See, Paul has just, Paul is imprisoned at the moment. He's in prison. He's getting uh, basically falsely accused for some things that he didn't really do. And they're trying to kill him just because he was spreading the word of God and really wanting to kill him because of the movement that he was starting. He had this apostolic power about him, this anointing. And, and so Paul, um, Paul goes into King Agrippa, and there's this guy named Festus that really wanted to kill him, kill Paul. But King Agrippa basically allows Paul to appeal to Caesar. Hey, I'd love to appeal to Caesar. And so Paul is going to be taking all the way to Rome. At this time, during Paul's time, Rome is the most powerful city on the planet. And Caesar is the most powerful guy on the planet. But God had a purpose for Paul to get to Rome. His destination was Rome. I want you to catch that. His destination was Rome. He knew where he was headed. So, I, and, But something happens along the way. He was running to the roar the most powerful man on earth to appeal to him. But something happens along the way, and I want to show you that. Acts chapter 27, I got a little scripture to read, so I'm going to read kind of fast. It says, since much time had passed, talking about the trial and stuff, the voyage was now dangerous because they had to sail across the sea to get to Rome because even the fast was already over. Paul advised them. He said, sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot, to the owner of the ship, than to what Paul said. Hey, let me tell you something. I don't think I'm listening to a prisoner either, right? I'm going to listen to the professionals who tell me if I can sell, and then I'm going to sell. But there's something about Paul. You see, Paul, and, and this is just a side note for you. It might help you. This ain't really my sermon. But, you know, there's a thing about steering with your spirit instead of steering with senses. Because when you steer in your life with senses, you will always go about things on how you feel emotionally or what you see. But you see, with Jesus, I walk by faith and not by sight. And I walk even though I might feel like I'm a little down, God's got my back. So we steer by the spirit. But check this out. It says, and because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could 
reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. But soon, a tempest tempestuous wind man that is a dangerous word right there it's just like it's scary that must have been a bad storm let's just say hurricane a hurricane wind called the northeaster struck down from the land could you imagine getting called out on lake pontchartrain in like five or six foot seas man that would not be a good moment i would not want to be out there when it's like that well that's kind of what paul and them are out in the storm and it's getting pretty rough out there. It's white capping, you know. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Calda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergrid the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on, on Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. That means they're throwing everything off the boat, trying to save their lives. And it says, on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And it says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. You ever feel like that storm just will never end in your life? It'll never come down? A storm is coming, and no small tempest lay on us. All hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them. He said, men, you should have listened to me. I told you so. And not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only for the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. That's going to be good in a moment. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have the faith in God that it will be exactly as I've told. But we must run aground on some island. We're going to wreck somewhere. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they had planned if possible to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors, left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. So they're being shipwrecked. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The boat uh, stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up as a surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on the planks or on the pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. And after we brought safely through, we learned that this island was called Malta. Malta. To tape, if you're taking notes, I need your help pronouncing this. I need your help pronouncing this title. I hope they ain't throwing it up for you and gave it away. I need you to look at your neighbor. I need you to say, neighbor. Come on, say, neighbor. I bite back. I bite back. Look at your, why don't you high five three people real quick? Say, I bite back. And we're going to get started on this. I bite back. I came in with attitude today. Um, so when I was growing up, I uh, was a young child. Uh, I can't really remember how old. My, my father and mother would probably have to remind me. But they got me this puppy. It was supposed to be like a future hunting dog for me. And we named him Rocky. So I had a dog at one point named Rocky. Yeah, what's up? I had a, name, I had a dog named Rocky. And, uh, and it was, he was super cool. But you see, uh, it wasn't a good idea to give me... Uh, a puppy, uh, a dog at that time, because you see, I was really, uh, I was really inspired by the likes of the Sting, and of Triple H, and Ric Flair, and so I was really small, and I couldn't practice those moves on my dad, so I had to have someone to practice the moves on, and so Rocky got the the, the blunt end of all of that, and no, I did not hurt him. I was very soft practicing on my DDT and my RKO and uh, and but, but just to be quite frank with you uh, I was uh, I was kind of rough with the dog I was young and stuff but we had a good bond he loved me like Rocky loved me to death but you see I was young and I didn't realize something that Rocky would grow and in a few months Rocky is now towering over me and he's like who's got who now and so every time it was he just all he knew was how to rough play 
because that's the way I had taught him. And so every time I got to where I was terrified of Rocky, I mean literally terrified of him because I walk outside, he would see me like, hey, there's my friend and run and just tackle me on the ground and like just start biting at my neck and stuff. And I just couldn't do anything. Man, he was so much bigger than me. Even my friends, guys, were terrified of this dog. Like if they saw the dog got out, they was running for the trampoline. I never forget one time we thought the trampoline was a safe place. And one time Rocky just comes running, he sees it, and he just jumped. And I kid you not, this dog jumped like six foot in the air and landed on the trampoline. We didn't know what to do at that point. It was all, all every man for himself at that point. Um, but I'll never forget my uncle telling me, he's like, well, you know you get a dog to, to, um, to respect you and to listen to you. If he's biting you, you got to bite him back. I'm like, you crazy, man, a bite him back. Well, I took the advice. You know, one day I was outside, and I didn't know my dad had let Rocky loose because he had, like, a little pin for him. And, uh, and, I, and like, <laughs> guys, it was like a horror film because I'm this young child, and I'll never, I'm walking in this, in this grass. <laughs> I'm walk, actually, I'm walking on this field, but there's, like, this tall grass that I was looking into, and all of a sudden Rocky's head just popped up out of it, and he saw me, and I was like, Oh, no. <laughs> I just took off running for my life. And he comes chasing me, and he hits me with his paws in my back. I, I just, like, land face first on the ground. He starts, like, nibbling at me. And all of a sudden, I just grabbed his head, and I turned around, and I bit his ear. I just, ah, <laughs> bit his ear. Kid you not, that dog listened to me and stopped messing with me anymore. Uh, and I love Rocky, and uh, Rocky was cool. But, you know, I bring that story up because, you see, As long as you let people walk all over you, as long as you let the devil walk all over you, as long as you let life's problems walk over you, you'll never have this attitude knowing that you could bite back, that you could stand up for yourself, that you don't have to cower down in fear, but that you can get back uh, in action, not letting something get you. You see, because it's, it's easy. It's easy for me to get up here last week and motivate you to run to the roar. And it was, you know, it's, it's easy because God's word's easy. It's, it's not complicated. I can open it up and give you all God's promises and all together we're like, yeah, let's run to the Lord. Matter of fact, if you haven't seen last week's sermon, you need to go back on our website. Would you agree, church? And you go back on our website, check that sermon out. Uh, it really gives a foundation for what we're, we're talking about. But the question is, how do you respond whenever you're running towards the roar? But, and you know you're doing the right thing because you're facing your fear, but at the moment, something happens. You get denied for that house loan. You just knew it was time for a house. You get shot down by that girl. You just knew you was going to get the date. Your mortgage unexpectedly goes up because of this magical thing called escrow, and you don't understand why it's happening. I mean, everybody, you get this sickness that comes out of nowhere and something happens and truth is the natural response when something like that happens is to divert back to what's familiar get back to the you know the 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 way that things used to be run the opposite way to the roar instead of going the the other way but you know it's just crazy because it's easy to let one bite send you back running the other way and Paul see Paul I bring up Paul because Paul embodied what it was like to be someone who would run to the roar no matter how many times he got bit. He would run to the roar, face his fear, no matter what was going on. I mean, matter of fact, I'm actually going to show you. There was this, just this tenacity about Paul. I mean, we could talk about David all day, but then I look at Paul's life, and I'm like, man, this dude, I, this dude was a dog. Like, he was cool. So I want us, us to observe him today because I want you to I'll just let me show you. Second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was writing to the church of Corinth. And look what he tells them. He says, look, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. That means they hit me, whipping him. All right. And then he says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. They tried to stone him to death. He said, three times I was shipwrecked. We're actually talking about one of his shipwrecks today. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, though I... And though many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is this daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all these churches. Because Paul, you see, he started churches all over the place. And he, they're all starting to turn corrupt. And now he's got anxiety because they're doing all kind of things they shouldn't be doing. And can you imagine right there Paul's life? Yet 
what, it's cool that Paul had this different kind of mindset because he said, you know, even though I went through all of those things, it was good because when I am weak, I can boast on my God who is strong in me. It was really cool, and that's what Paul kind of talks about. But I bring Paul up today because he is. He's the guy that embodies what it means to run to the Lord even when you get bit. You see, because in 2018, 2017, maybe for the entire life, you tried in January of your, your month to start over and start running to the Lord, but something happens, and it makes you run the other way. Well, today, today I want to give you practical ways on how to continue running to the Lord, even when things get bad. Because, you see, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of times we blame the bites on the wrong D word. You know that? So many times it's the easy way out for us to say, oh, the devil did it. <laughs> it was the devil who did it. And although the devil may tempt you and do some things, how many of you know sometimes it's the other D word? Sometimes it's your own decisions that get you running back the opposite direction, not just the devil. You can't blame everything on the devil. Eventually, you got to realize it's you that decides the way you're going to respond. And so I want to share a few decisions that we're going to have to make whenever we get bit. That whenever you're going to have to get bit and you're running towards the roar, you got a few decisions you got to make when life gets a little hard. Three decisions you'll have to make. I'm going to make it easy for you today. Number one is this. You're going to have to choose between reason or revelation. You're going to have to choose between reason or revelation. How many of you know that we all look for reasons to why something happened to us? You will run yourself wild trying to figure out a reason to when something goes bad. I mean, it's like, it's got, I mean, don't you think everything that happens has to have a reason, right? But you will drive yourself crazy if you keep hunting for a reason. Matter of fact, look at it. When this verse, in, in Acts chapter 27, verse 18 that we just read, it says, Since we, talking about like Paul and the crew members, were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison, jettison the cargo, and on the third day threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no st small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Basically, the crew members are saying, this storm, it's not ending. You ever felt like that before? It's like the bite happened and it's just not ending. Like This storm is not ending and we're losing all hope. You know, I could just imagine what's actually happening right now. You see, because they've got to be hunting for a reason. Yeah, reason, obviously the storm, but think about it. Think about this crew members. I bet you they're yelling. I bet you they're arguing. I bet you they're complaining because you had one group who said we need to sell. You had another group who said we didn't need to sell. So they're pointing the finger at each other saying it's your fault. No, it's your fault. And they're hunting for a reason the whole time. Man, and, and, and that's, exactly what, man, that's exactly what we do. We'll, we'll hunt for a reason. Man, it was the devil who did that. It was the devil. Or no, oh, what's better is you know what we'll do? Oh, God did this to me. God did this. It was, it was God. Or I noticed, too. There's something that happens, you see, I want you to follow my logic on this, because you see, we hunt for a reason, but if you continue hunting for a reason, you know that all it, all it does is eventually lead to you placing the blame on something or somebody. That's all it is. You're going to either blame the devil, you're going to blame yourself, you're going to blame God, you're going to blame somebody else when you're driving yourself wild looking for a reason. Man, man, this man, you cheat on your wife, and you're like, oh, the devil made me do it, baby. I promise you. It wasn't, it wasn't, nope, it was yourself. It was your own self that did that. You know, look, I ran to the roar. I ran to the roar, and I got laid off unexpectedly, and I don't, I don't know what to do. You know, and, and it's just God hates me. God just hates me. It's, it's a logic. It's what actually happens. You know, I ran to the roar, and I felt like it was, I, got, I got bit, you know, and I just realized it was me. I just can't do it, you know. You know, maybe, just maybe I could have avoided it. Yeah, maybe you could have avoided it. Maybe, maybe just, maybe so. But let me tell you something. If we stay stuck in the reason, we will miss out on the revelation that God wants to give us. You need to catch this right now because there are times in your life where all you're doing is hunting for a reason to why you got bit. And you're trying to understand how this all happened when God is trying to reveal something to you in your life. 
Are you going to choose reason? Or are you going to choose revelation? But you see all these men, these crew members that are on this boat, all they're like is, man, I, I'm, they're complaining, they're arguing, they're upset, they're pointing the finger at one another. But then all of a sudden, Paul, who embodies what it looks like to run to the roar, even when you get bit, he stands up in front of everybody. Look what he says. He says in, in, in verse 21, men, you should have listened to me and not have sell sell from Crete. He's telling me, I told you so, but look, check this out. He says, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I've told. Let me tell you something. Paul said, you might have a reason, but God gave me a revelation. We're all going to be okay. It's going to be all good in here. Paul says, look, I want you to, can you, you bring up, can you make verse 24 again? Go back one. Paul says, I need you to understand. I feel like it was God. God was telling Paul, you can stay stuck in the reason. You can stay complaining and arguing and wondering if things are going to get better. But look, I got to tell you, don't be afraid because you got to get to Rome. You can't die here right now. I need you to get to your destination. I need you to get to, Ma to, uh, to, to Rome. If you stay stuck in a reason, you'll never get there because God says, I know you're in a battle right now, but I got a bigger battle ahead of you in Rome you need to get ready for. I can't stay stuck in reason. Look at your neighbor and said, I have a revelation. I had a revelation. Let me tell you something. You can't fight the devil with a reason. Can't fight the devil with a reason. But you can fight the devil with a revelation. You can fight the devil with a revelation. You know, I had a moment I haven't really shared in a while, but uh, for me to be doing what I'm doing, I had a life-altering moment. I was 19 years old. Um, I was dating a girl that I thought I was going to marry. I had a best friend in the entire world. It was two people that I spent my entire life with, and uh, not entire life, but I spent you know, many years I was really close to, and because I was so close to them, I kind of cut everybody else out. Um, and, and so uh, in a matter of six months, that relationship ended. And that best friend of mine stabbed me in the back like I, I don't have time to go into all that. But, man, when I tell you I got stabbed in the back and I was hurt, guess what? I was hurt by a church, people in the church. Maybe you've been in here before and you're like, oh, yeah, church has hurt me. Yep, because the youth pastor that was really taking me under his wing, he wasn't even in my corner in all of this. He even stabbed my back through all of this. And so here I am. 19 years old, I get stabbed in the back like nobody's business. I lose this relationship that I thought was ended, and all of a sudden, nobody's around me. And it's so easy for me to, in that moment, try to find a reason why this is happening. Part of me wanted to get out of church. I didn't even want to really go. There was times where my parents had, for me, for me, this was big because I loved going to church. Even growing up, I was serving since I was 12 years old, playing drums and stuff. So I was always there every Sunday. So when it got to the point to where they had to drag me to church, you know it was bad. I was fearful of, of this family. I was fearful of the church at the time. I was fearful of what, what, what was happening, and I was trying to look for a reason, and I didn't know what was going on. I, had, I was experiencing a lot of pain at 19 years old. I was going to school at Southeastern Louisiana University. I thought I was going to be a physical therapist. That's what I was going for. And God, you know, I, I decided at, at one time, I said, yeah, I can't be like this anymore. And I get into my bathroom, and sometimes the bathroom is the best place for revelation. And um, I get in the bathroom, and I get on my hands and knees, and I just weep. And I just weep, guys. I mean, it still breaks me up right now about how much pain I felt in that moment. I don't know. My parents didn't know where I was or anything like that. I was in my bathroom weeping. I wasn't praying. I was trying to stay in God's presence, but I was just weeping because I was hurting. And in that moment, I can't even explain it to you guys. I can't even under, sometimes I don't even understand it, but I, I heard a gentle whisper. He said, Ryan, you're not too old to do what I've called you to do. Go to Bible college. 
develop as a leader, and plant a church in a large metropolitan area and call that church Church on a Mission. I had the name of the church at 19 years old that God had ordained in my life. And in the moment of desperation, in the moment of pain, God gave me a revelation. And look, if God wouldn't have revealed that, what would happen with this? Here we are two years into what's going on. And I bring that up because I want you to notice something. You see, it took a situation of suffering to get to a point of revelation in my life. It took a situation. You need to realize that that sometimes when you get bit, God has to use that situation for you to stay put and just listen so he can reveal something to you in your life. That your own suffering right now could lead to the revelation that God wants to give you in your life. Man, you've got to choose revelation over reason if you would decide, look for it. And I want to tell you something. Look. The revelation that God gave me, guess what? It didn't give me a reason to why all that happened. Here I am almost 10 years since all of that happened, and I still don't know a reason why that happened. But if I'd have stayed stuck in the reason, I would have missed the bigger battles ahead, the revelation. God says, you're not done yet. You've got to get to Rome. You've got to get to Rome, man got to get there, man. Where's your destination? And I want to let you know something else, too. Because some, many, some of us may think, you may be thinking, well, I'm going through something bad right now, and I just don't hear God in it, and I don't hear any. You know, God's not going to give you a revelation every time you get bit. Sometimes you've got to realize that the revelation you got 10 years ago is the same God who's with you at that moment, and that same revelation could be the same revelation that keeps you going. Because last year was a tough year. Our church is two years old, and the first few months, I wanted to quit. We barely had anybody coming. I didn't feel like anything were going. Finances were bad. But it was that revelation that I had in my bathroom at that time that said, God said, I ordained a church, and I've got to build the man before the ministry. So continue going. It was that revelation 10 years ago that kept me going. And so whatever revelation God's given you, man, you've got to keep to it. You've got to keep to it. You know how many things God has revealed to you in his word? You're like, I don't have revelation. I'll read the Bible. There's revelation all in this Bible about what God can do in your life. Man, think about, I think about the disciple uh, John. Man, John was a guy uh, who he's watching all his friends, his dis- other disciples get killed for the Lord's name because they were preaching the Lord's name. And there was an attempt on his life, and he ends up getting exiled to this island called Patmos. And I guarantee you it was an uncomfortable place that he did not expect to be. But in that moment, God gave him a revelation, and he wrote the book of Revelation that we have in the Bible today, man. I've got to choose re- revelation over reason. Point number two is this. You've got to choose. You're going to have a decision. Are you going to divert to the familiar or are you going to embrace the unfamiliar? Divert to the familiar or embrace the unfamiliar? You see, we love things that are familiar to us. Things that are familiar, man, when things go wrong, it's so easy to just go back to what's good. Go back to the easy things because guess what? It's comfortable. I like it that way when it's comfortable. But I'm going to tell you something. It's very hard to see the power of God work in your life when, it, when you stay comfortable or when familiarity has a grip on your heart. Matter of fact, the Bible kind of teaches this, and it shows us with Jesus. You see, Jesus uh, was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth, and he was, so he was a Nazarene. And his hometown, being Nazareth, one day he's like, hey, I want to go bring miracle-working power of God Back to my hometown, back to Nazareth. And so he wanted to go bless all these hometown people. But watch out what happens. It says he went away from there, came to his hometown, and his, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at Jesus. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there. Man, these people missed out on the incredible miracles that God wanted to perform because they let familiarity into their heart. And it became a barrier to them seeing Jesus move in their life. 
man. And I saw that, man. Familiarity is a dangerous place to be. And I guarantee you that this crew, when they get shipwrecked or they get lost on this, in this storm, I'd want to be back in my home, back in my bed, around my, peop- my family. I don't want to be out in a storm that has happened. How many of you would agree with that? Now, I've got to get back to a place that's familiar. But you see, when we get back to a place that's familiar, hmm, that's, that's when it gets tough. And see, what happens is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip through this part real quick, but it says that they struck a reef. Bring up verse, uh, Tori, bring up verse 44 for me. It says that they, they struck a reef, and they, and they were shipwrecked, and some of them were getting on the planks and the pieces of, sh- of, of the ship. I hope that some of them moved over because we all know that two could have fit on that Titanic door, right? And so it was all that were brought safely to land in the very next verse, 28, uh, verse 1. It says, after that, they were brought safely through, and we then learned that the island was called Malta. Look at your neighbor and say, Malta. Malta. They had no idea where Malta was. They had no idea. They were, they were, guys, they were like literally just all over the place. The storm's just dragging them all kind of places. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, look, Paul was right. God's not going to let us die. There's some land right there we need to make for it. And so they make for this island called Malta. Malta. Do you know where Malta is? Can I show you where Malta is? Do we have that picture? If you can throw up, throw up that picture real quick. You see where that little pin drop is, the little red drop? You see, let me show everybody real quick. You see, they were sailing from somewheres around. I'm too short to reach it. Somewheres around here. And they were going to Rome, which was up there by Italy. And so they were trying to shoot a straight path there. But they ended up in that storm that left them to that little red dot right there. Right there. And that's where they went. That's that's Malta. You don't believe me? Let me show somebody. I need some. Can I sit right there? Got you. I got. Let me show you. We're going to Bible time real quick, real quick. You see, Paul started here, and they went, and they went, and they went, and then this is where they hit the storm. You see, they thought it was going to be a, a smooth pass to Rome. You see, they, would, they, thought, they thought they would go all the way straight to Rome, but the storm hits them, and they veer off, and they hit this little bitty island. You barely see that. This little bitty island, guys, it's crazy. It's, it's Malta. Malta. How did I end up on Malta? Come on, man. I'm trying to get to Rome. You know what Rome rep- represents real quick? You see, Rome represents that destination you know. It's that purpose you know, right? So Rome represents, um, let's think about it. Some of you know your purpose today. Like, I knew a pastor. Like, I'm trying to become a pastor, you know. So that, no, that's my destination. And then your destination changes as new seasons come in. But maybe, maybe your destination, maybe your Rome is starting a family. You know, we're trying to start a family right now. That's a Rome for us, you know. So we're, we're headed to Rome, and we've had some rocky roads on the way, but we're headed to Rome. So that, maybe that's your destination. Maybe it's starting a business. Maybe it's getting healthy. 2019, i got to get back in the gym. What is your Rome? What is your Rome? Think about your Rome. Because, you see, it's not always an easy path to Rome. Sometimes a storm hits, and, and you go to, to Malta. Malta's not a cool place, man. You know what Malta represents? You know what Malta represents? Malta represents the unfamiliar place. Malta represents that season you didn't see coming. Come on, somebody. Malta represents that layoff you didn't expect to happen. Malta represents that relationship you didn't see ending. Malta represents that emotional place in your life that you never thought you could actually be going through. Because I never thought that I could be a guy that was depressed. But last year, I went through some stretches of depression. And I was like, wow, this stuff is real. I feel for the people who will go through depression. Because it is not a good thing. It makes you want to lay up in bed and not do anything. I, have you ever been to Malta? Has somebody been to Malta like me? We've been to Malta before. I mean, you got to be in Malta. Malta's not a good place to be, man. It's an unfamiliar place that makes us uncomfortable. And I just, I don't want to be in Malta, man. Some of you are in Malta today. That storm blew you right onto this unfamiliar land, and all you can think about, like the other crew members, is take me back home. Get me back to that familiar place. 
I don't like change. I don't like this. Get me back here. And, and check out what Acts chapter 28, we're going to continue reading through the story. Verse 2, check this out. It says that the native people, this is so they, they shipwreck on this island, and it says that the native people showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and it was cold. But Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire. We're going to stop right there. Now check this out. You see, because native people, that word right there, it can also be translated, if you translate it into this Greek original language, it can be translated as barbarians. I don't want to land on no island that's got barbarians, guys. I don't know about you, but I definitely don't want to be in that place. And so they land on this island with these barbarians that could have easily been some people who said, you ain't coming up on our land. You ever heard, what's that island? Anybody know what that island is that has, like, not even been uh, explored because there's a group of people on it that will literally kill you if you come? What's it called? We all know. You know what I'm talking about. But it's like that. I feel like that's what Malta could have been. But it says that they showed them unusual kindness. And you see, just a side note real quick for some of you. You need to realize something. That when you get to an unfamiliar place in your life, God will send people into your life to support you and show you unusual kindness in your time of need. Just like he did. Like, this is just the mystery of God. I don't know how he does it. He does it for our good. Because you see, whenever I was wanting to give up when I was 19 and all that was happening to me and I got backstabbed and stuff like that. You see, at church at the time, we had two locations. We had one location here. We had one location here. I was the one over here with this youth pastor. But there was another youth pastor at this location who really I didn't know that well. But in the middle of my turmoil, in the middle of my pain, he reached out to me and he said, hey, I just want you to know I'm in your corner. I got your back. And you never know how much that meant to me. Someone showed unusual kindness to me, and it just changed everything. I hope that some of you may have given up on church, but you came to church on a mission today, and the volunteers showed you unusual kindness because that goes a long way. It'll change everything because that's the part of who Jesus is, and he's a mystery way. Wait, bring that verse back up. I ain't done yet. And so it says this. See, the easy thing is to divert back to what's familiar, but check this out. It says that Paul, see, all the other crew members are cuddled up, around, you know, cold, wet, wishing they were back home, probably still grumbling and complaining to each other. Man, because of you, I had to swim through this cold water. You wouldn't even scoot over and let me have some of that plank, you know. And I almost drowned to death, and, and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm going. But Paul, who embodies what it looks like to run to the roar, man, he gathered some sticks up, and he built a fire. He helped them. You know what Paul's doing right there? You know what Paul's doing? Paul is embracing the unfamiliar. He's embracing the unfamiliar. And I just needed to tell somebody in here today that you think, you know, let me just be real with you. Some of you are praying for a specific opportunity, but you aren't willing to go through the adversity that is required about that opportunity. You're like, I want to get to Rome, but God says, I've got to send you to Malta first. You've got to learn some stuff there before you can get to Rome and be used like I need to use you. But truth is, some of us don't want to go through the adversity that comes with that opportunity. But it's a new you now, right? You're not the old you anymore. You're not the one that used to get bit and run back the opposite direction. Now you're the guy who says, you know what, it's a new me this year. I might have owed me would have ran back to what's familiar, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get, I'm going to embrace the unfamiliar. I didn't expect to get laid off, but you know what? I'm going to get my resume back together. I'm going to get my my best suit. I'm going to go find me something else. It's going to pay better too. I didn't expect my bills bills to go up because of this escrow thing. But you know what? Let me revisit my spreadsheet. Let me rework this budget. I didn't expect that relationship to end. But my mom's been telling me forever that that girl was crazy. And I needed to end it forever ago. And if I would have just listened to her, I would have saved myself from some heartache. But you know what? I'm going to make myself a lot better so that the next person comes. I'm going to be 10 times better for you. Thank you, next. And so I'm going to get to that kind of life because that's who I am. I'm going to embrace the unfamiliar. Paul embraces. He embraces. Look, let me tell you something. Malta is not fun. 
but Malta is necessary for the development of the purpose of God in your life. You need to go to Malta sometime. Somebody got to embrace Malta. It's a good place. It's not a fun place. It's a good place. And then check this out. Last point before we get out of here. I know. Point number three. Do or die. You're like, Pastor, where are you going with this one? Because you know what? When you get bit, you've got to choose revelation over reason. You've got to choose to embrace the unfamiliar. And you've got to realize that when you get bit, it's your do or die moment. Do I revert back to the old me that would run away from the roar? Or do I fight back? And this is where it gets good. Acts chapter 28, we keep reading the story. It says this. This is hilarious, guys. You might laugh with me. It says, Paul gathered some of the bundle of sticks. So he's embracing the unfamiliar, right? He he gathers some of the sticks. He puts them on the fire. And then a viper, a snake, guys, came out because of the heat, and it fastened on his hand. It bit him. He's grabbing some sticks, sticking it on the fire. All of a sudden, the snake just jumps out. I don't know about you, but I would not have liked that moment. And you know, all I can think about when I read this is it's like, Right when you thought everything was okay and you're safe, something else happens. You ever been there before? It's like, man, it's all good. I'm in a good spot now. And then something else happens. It's a, it, watch, keep on going. And it says, and when the native people saw the creature hanging from his head, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. You know who they represent? They represent all the people that are around you that support you to your face, but in behind closed doors, all they want to do is see you fail and see you drop down and not do what God's called you to do because there are people like that in this world. <laughs> so, so Paul, I'm like, man, I feel for Paul right now. Man, you're the one trying to support everybody, show revelation to everybody, and Paul's like, I, I need to get myself warm. I'm embracing the unfamiliar, and then he gets bit by a snake. Man, so Paul literally, we're talking about I bite back. Paul literally got bit. He literally got this point. At this point, Paul is imprisoned. He's shipwrecked. He's beaten. He's cold. He's wet, and now he's bitten, and Paul Paul could have easily thrown in the towel and quit, and he could have physically died in that moment. He could have gave up. I don't want that anymore. And you know, maybe some of you in here today, you started running to the roar, but you got bit, and something inside of you died. The joy you used to have, the determination you used to have, the purpose you used to have, something, something, something inside of you died. But you see, God gave me a word today to help some of you reshape your thinking. He gave me a word to help me reshape my thinking on this. Because, you see, in past years, we might have chosen to find a reason to go back to the familiar. A reason to go back. I want you to get reason to go back to the familiar. But it's a new me. Because in Christ, I'm a new creation. And the new me knows this is my do or die moment. I've gotten bit. And either I lay down or watch what Paul does. If you want to see Paul's response to this, this is crazy. This is why Paul embodies what it means to run to the roar. Acts chapter 28, 5 and 6. Paul was a boss. It says that Paul, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. And the islanders were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to them, they changed their minds and said, he's a god. (laughs) He's like, wait, wait. So Paul, it doesn't say that the, the snake just bites him. It says it fastens onto his hand. So I can only imagine that Paul, Paul's putting these snakes, these sticks together, and he gets bit, and he just picks it up and just like, really? Really? <laughs> right now? In this moment? But I want you to catch this because something on him is trying to make him die. And some of you are letting something bite you to try to suck the life out of you. But Paul, man, Paul had this kind of mindset, guys. Paul had this mindset. He said, look, just talking to the snake. Look, you viper. I already had a revelation. You see, God's not done with me yet. 
God still needs me in Rome. I'm not dying on Malta. And you know what he did? He sh- shook that thing off. Get off. He shook that off. Man, I don't know how many of you need to do that, but this will change some of your mindset. If you would just shake some things off in your life into the fire and let them burn up so you can continue to run into the roar. And let me tell you something. In the famous words, in the famous words of the theologian Taylor Swift, players are going to play, 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 play. Haters are going to hate, 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 hate. Heartbreakers are going to break, break. Come on. Fakers are going to fake, fake, fake. But all I'm going to do in 2019 is lift that snake up and I'm going to shake it off. Come on, lift your arm up. Shake it off right now. Shake that snake off your arm. It's your do or die moment. If I'm going to Rome, I cannot die in Malta. It can't happen. God says, I've got greater things in store for you. Don't you lay down and give up. Don't you lay down and die. I know life is hard. I know life seems to kick you in the butt sometimes, and it doesn't seem like anything's going to get any better. But I've got something else in store for you. You need to get back up and go. Y'all thought that was the good part. I haven't forgotten. Here's the good part. You see, the islanders, and this ain't the good part. One more part, and then the good part. But the islanders, they they see Paul. If I was this islander, man, and I saw this man that I didn't even know just go woof and shake this deadly snake off him, I'd have been like, whoa, I need to be his friend. That's like if Snooky was here, that'd be Snooky power right there. Ooh, just shake that thing off, man. I I couldn't imagine. But you know what? The islanders changed their mind about them. How many of you got some people you need to prove to today? You need to say, you might think I'm going to fail, but I got a God with me. And a God who stands before me will never fail me, will never leave me, will never forsake me. You thought I was going to fail, but I'm showing you it's a new me. It's my do or die moment. And I'm going to Rome no matter what. I ain't dying here in Malta, man. And now here's the good part. And now here's the good part. Because Paul... Check this out. Acts chapter 28, 7 and 8. Last one, I promise you. We're going to get out of here. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitality for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever, and I can't say that word, dysentery. Dysentery? Dysentery. Okay. Thank you. I should have practiced that. Dang it. And Paul visited him. And prayed, and putting his hands on him, he healed him. Do you see what's happening here? I don't think you see it. I I think you need Paul. I could see Paul in this moment. He he had a snake hanging from his hand, right? (laughs) I could see him when he finds out and he hears about this guy named Publius, his father, who needs to be healed. I could see Paul start smiling. Oh, God, I know why you got me on Malta. I know exactly why. And Paul walks up to this guy. What's up, Publius? He walks up to this guy named Publius, and he he puts his hand on his head. And he prays. And he heals him. Do you see it yet? Do you see it yet? I I still don't think they see it, Publius. I still don't think they see it. I need to tell somebody something that I saw in the Bible when I was reading this. The same hand that was bitten by the snake was the same hand, come on somebody, that he would lay his hand on that person's head and he would say, be healed in the name of Jesus. I need somebody to know that what the devil meant to destroy, God will use to build you up to get you to Rome. I don't care what you may think or what the devil may think about you or what people may think about you, but all I know is the same hand that was used to destruction, God used for healing in this place. You might think that the situation you're going through is going to destroy you, but I think that it's going to be the very thing that God uses to deliver you in the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm looking. And you know what you're going to do? 
can't believe I forgot this part. The next time you get bitten, you're going to stand up and you're going to look the devil straight in the face and you're going to say, devil, you might have meant me for destruction. You might have wanted me to cower down in darkness. You may have wanted me to cower down in fear. You may have wanted me to find a reason so I give up. You may have wanted me to go back to what's familiar, but guess what? It's my do or die moment. It's a new me, and I need you to know something, devil. I bite back, baby. I bite back. I ain't worried about what's going on, but I bite back. I need some of you to look up. I'm looking for a church that's going to stand up and say, you can throw your arrows all you want, devil, but I got the armor of God on me. For he who started a good work in me will be faithful to complete it in the name of Jesus. Everybody on their feet right now. And I bite back. I bite back. Look at your neighbor and say, I bite back. See, Paul is on Malta. Paul is on Malta. And he goes on to heal more people than Publius. And I could just imagine Paul is leaving Malta finally, headed to Rome, smiling, thinking, huh, I saw what you did there, God. The devil tried to destroy me. The natural earth of the winds tried to destroy me. But whatever tries to destroy me, you'll use that very thing to deliver me and to use me for your goodness. Because now this little bitty island named Malta, y'all saw it. Y'all saw Malta. This little bitty island now knows who Jesus is. How many of you know that if you would handle your Malta in the hands of God, there are going to be people who will leave knowing who Jesus is because of your impact and how you handled that? With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed.